Well, hello. I know that there are some people there because I was just talking to some. It feels really strange. I'm hoping the rest of you are out there listening and excited to hear some amazing authors talking to us and visiting with us. I am coming to you from Park Rapids Area Library, and we are a part of the Kichigami Regional Library System. And this year, it was our turn to host Moving Words, and I was really excited about it, and I'm still excited about it. However, it's a little less exciting that I don't get to have these people here in our library and have you here in our library with them, but let's do that again another time. Welcome, thanks for coming. I'm excited to hear what everyone has to say. Thanks so much, Jody. We're so pleased to be partnering with the Park Rapids Area Library and Kichigami Regional Library System. I'm Elaine Hopkins. I'm the Director of Programs and Services for the Friends of the St. Paul Public Library. And this is our third year of running the Moving Words Writers Across Minnesota Tour. This year, a <coughs> virtual one. And I'm so pleased that we're kicking off the series this fall, featuring the talents of Karen Babine, Hyde Erdrich, Peter Guy, and Cal Kalia Yang. So as we get started tonight, we'd like to take a moment to acknowledge the Dakota people, indigenous keepers of the land from which we are broadcasting tonight. This land was reserved by the Dakota in the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux signed with the United States in 1851, and it remains sacred to them today. I also want to acknowledge the Ojibwe people, fellow indigenous inhabitants of this land. Dakota and Ojibwe people are also the original stewards of stories in this place now called Minnesota. And we at the Friends honor that tradition and the knowledge and values embedded in it as we work to lift up storytellers in our state today. So as you may know, the Friends has coordinated the Minnesota Book Awards for 14 years now. And as Minnesota's Center for the Book, we produce programming that benefits all ages and reaches all corners of the state. This programming is supported by funding for the Center for the Book included in Minnesota's K-12 Education Bill. We're grateful to all of the state representatives and senators who advocated for that funding. So on to the main event. This series is made possible in part by the state of Minnesota through a grant to the Minnesota Department of Education and additional support is provided by the Harlan Boss Foundation for the Arts, Northern Lights Library Network and Education Minnesota. So we'll have a reading with our wonderful authors, followed by a conversation and a Q&A with you. Once we open things up for questions, please feel free to put those questions in the chat and I will share them with our authors tonight. Um, we'll also provide some information about where you can buy their books. We'd like to promote local area uh, Beagle and Wolf to purchase all of the books by our wonderful writers here, as well as some other websites. So you'll see information in the chat throughout the evening. So um, as I said, to start things off, we'll have a brief reading and presentation by each author. And first, we'll have memoirist and essayist Karen Babine. She's author most recently of All the Wild Hungers, A Season of Cooking and Cancer. Welcome, Karen. Thanks for having me. I am really, really excited to be here because Park Rapids is my hometown library and uh, uh, it's good to be back home, uh, even though I am broadcasting from Chattanooga. Um, and so, um, I am, I am deeply grateful to be here. So I'm gonna read a little bit from All the Wild Hungers. Um, and I'm gonna read from the middle. My favorite sous chef stands on a red stool so she can crack eggs for me, a task she has recently mastered. Her blonde hair escapes its ponytail as she bends her head in concentration and carefully taps the egg on the counter, tucking her little thumbs in the break and prying the shell apart deliberate in her attention to keep shells out of the bowl. She looks at my skillet named Agnes on medium heat on the stove and says reverently, Aunt Kinney, I love that pan. The finely sliced onions sizzle gently. The orange of the pan glows with cheer. The black of the cast iron surface gleams like satisfaction. I've been informed that the gender neutral term for niece and nephew is nibbling. I find this delightful, the sounds of it rolling on my tongue. I'm cooking with the nibblings today. It even sounds delicious. 
I like that Cora and her toddler inability to pronounce my name named me Kinney. My father's sis her father's sister became Yo-Yo. I find the label for women like me, Pank, professional aunt, no kids, mildly amusing. It is the lack, the absence that is strange, abnormal, the way we cannot conceive of other modes of creating and maintaining family. Cora and Henry and whoever their new sibling will be have only aunts, and I like the language of it. I learned to aunt by watching it done well. We often describe my father's aunt as the most right-brained person we've ever met, whose creative talents never led to culinary success as often as we often joke that Kay could burn water. A couple of weeks ago, she sent my father an email that ended with, gotta go change clothes, going dancing tonight, and nobody was sure if she was kidding or not. She has neuropathy in her legs and can't feel them, but is entirely within her character to go dancing anyway. She was always delighted to see us when we visited her in California, truly delighted, and we recognize that as rare. About the time I was 16 or 17, I became her protege as the apprentice family historian, which connected us more strongly. Henry was born on Kay's 90th birthday. What we do not know is that my sister's third child will be born on the day she passes away. I also learned how to aunt from my sis father's sister, Teresa, who is 12 years younger than my father, the youngest of five siblings. My earliest memories of her involved being in my grandparents' house and running into her room in the dark of morning and jumping on her bed, much the same way Cora does with me now. I couldn't have been more than three or four, but I remember the curtains pulled against the morning, and I remember the red of the tab cans. Aunt Teresa and Uncle Robin were always glad to see us, and it was never the perfunctory hug that adults often give kids. Our visits became joy-filled spaces of Mongolian barbecue, griddles set up in their backyard, tables mounted with anything you could think to put on them. It was from then that I learned the delight of sesame oil, something absent from my Scandinavian culinary world. Teresa and Robin wanted to be with us, not just around us, and I remember how that made me feel as a kid. It's not an easy role to play, not if one wants to live up to their example. Aunting is an active verb, an extension of creating a family. My youngest sister and I work to create the relationship on our own terms. My sister, also a pank, works for the state government and makes civic engagement as natural to the kids as breathing, is never too young to march and protest. My sisters took Cora at the age of four months to walk her first picket line to support her mother's fellow nurses on strike for better patient safety and quality of care. When my niece was eight months old, my youngest sister took her when she went to vote. My nephew, at four months, joined his family on the lawn of the Minnesota State Capitol for the signing of the marriage equality bill. Today, Cora cracks eggs for me and we bake a cake. So this book is about um, my mom's really weird cancer. Uh, and the, the odd thing about uh, being back here tonight is that two years ago, um, I was very lucky to be a part of this event uh, and it was right after she passed away. So uh, it's a little, little bittersweet, um, but tonight it's emphasis on the sweet. When pumpkin became a term of endearment is a matter of debate, offset from sweetness, from sugar, sugar plum, honey, even the saltiness of peanut, the food names we call each other, the tasty and the sweet, the foods that give us the most visceral pleasure, the greatest joy, the fullest sensory experience. My littlest pumpkin, my littlest peanut, my nephew, Henry, is three. After his allergy diagnosis, my mother took this to the social media trend of painting one of her Halloween pumpkins teal to signify a peanut-free space with non-food treats for other kids who have allergies. Once I made an offhand comment to Henry about driving his mother nuts and Henry immediately started crying. What? I asked, alarmed. Don't say nuts, he whispered, curling up into a ball on the couch. Nuts? Why not? I'm allergic to nuts, he said so quietly. I had to strain to hear him and it took a moment to marvel at the idea that he thought the word itself could hurt him. Henry was a giraffe for Halloween this year, his costume punctuated by round blue glasses, trailed by my sister's black lab Marley dressed as a lion, embarrassed as only a big dog can be. When the nibblings walk through the door with a basket of miniature pumpkins and squashes not designed for eating, we exclaim, oh, pumpkins from our pumpkins. On my stove sits Penelope Pumpkin, the third addition to my cast iron collection, a two-quart Le Creuset Cocotte, pumpkin-shaped and pumpkin-colored, small and bright and ridiculous. 
I have no explanation for why the pots were named, from Agnes to Estelle to Minnie to Penelope, but perhaps the silly naming counteracted so much unknowing around me. Is it too much to say that I love this pot? The kind of visceral happiness that should be reserved for people, not inanimate objects. And yet, I love this pot. We tend to disparage the pleasure of things, the joy we gain from objects, but in their best sense, things are icons. In the tradition of religious iconography of Orthodox Christianity, icons are windows between ourselves and God, the invisible webs of connection we need when the world tilts sideways. Sometimes the link is between people who have gone, but the thing still exists. Maybe it collects dust on a shelf, a thing too fragile and precious to be part of everyday life, but it is still an icon to that person, that memory, that feeling. When I brought home Penelope Pumpkin, I admitted that my thrifted stockpile of vintage cast iron in shades of desca ware and Le Creuset and croissants might have gotten out of control, but the collection of them in what I would come to call the cook nook brings me shimmering joy. In the case of Penelope Pumpkin, I'd long wanted something small and beautiful that could live on the back burner and make small quantities of soup for one person. So I set Penelope there, cheerful in that classic color they call flame, comical in her scallop shape and offset handle, something joyfully satisfying in her smallness. Around Halloween, we are directed to introduce small amounts of dairy into Henry's diet. My mother does not like cheese and she never has. Henry will eat an entire box of macaroni and cheese by himself, which is amazing for such a tiny creature. Later, I will experiment with cacio e pepe and fettuccine alfredo, the emulsified pastas of cheese and pasta water, the emulsified pastas of cheese and pasta water that come together like magic without cream. Not long ago, my mother told me she does not like the way cheese squeaks against her teeth. She can tolerate it if it is part of a recipe. And I returned to my childhood memories of bright orange cheese, the Colby and the cheddar and the Velveeta, which ring for me now in the same pumpkin orange as Penelope, who makes Parmesan broth against the chill of fall. Before long, the house takes on the most spectacular scent, a rich kind of sharpness, what the most potent love must taste like in those moments where we are most helpless, deep in sleep or fear. Eating our feelings is pejorative, something shameful in this desire to find comfort in food, but I find delight in the fat from the melting cheese having woven itself into lace-like bubbles on the surface, slightly darker than the golden broth, and eating my feelings seems healthy and desirable. The movement back into murmurs of pumpkin and honey as my small nephew fights against sleep in my arms. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karen. That's really, um, I'm remembering the event that you were at um, and I'm, that's really a poignant memory. Um, so thank you very much for sharing that. Next up, we have poet Hyde Erdrich who has a brand new collection coming out. I have to say that I am incredibly excited. It'll arrive October 6th, Little Big Bully. And this is a book that you can pre-order from Birchbark Books. And so we will put that link in the chat. I'm thrilled to have you join us again for Moving Words. Welcome, Hyde. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Jody, for having us in the library and uh, Thank you, Elaine and Wendy from Friends of the Library. I'm very pleased to be here with Karen, Peter, and Kalia. I have had the chance to read with a couple of you before, and I love to hear uh, your stories. My work is, you know, poetry, so I'm going to be your palate cleanser to keep with Karen's beautiful food metaphor. I'm just going to read three poems, and uh, I decided I wanted to read love poems today because I just feel like we need a little more love. So they're somewhat odd love poems, but I'll, I'll move through them. The Buzz. Do you remember, my love, the buzz, as you drew me to you in the over green of our first garden? Do you remember the humming? You matched your hot palm to my smooth, cool palm amidst a mad tumbling. Cosmos and sage and asters alive with bees dripping and dropping on my dress. Your red beard against my breast sweetly rumbling, oh honeysuckle. We pulsed and beat that hot staccato. We swayed to drones doom, a swoon on swelling air the now rare music of bees. And we 
were ever so young and so we never were stung. So that's the buzz. And then I'm going to read um, a paired poem about domestic love and how after you've been married a while, you end up um, thinking about the chores a lot. And the first one is called Laundress. Given over to love, she unballs the socks, lets fall debris of days, leaf litter, sand grain, slub of some sticky substance. She picks it all for the sake of the stainless tub of the gleaming new front loader. Given over to love long ago when her own exasperated moan bounced off the quaint speckled enamel of the old top loader, vowing she would do this always and well. She fell in love then, she fell in line. In a march of millions, you pair them. Two by two, you marry the socks. I'm gonna try and hold my book where I can both see it and it doesn't interfere with my strange light source. Sorry about that, I keep coming and going. This one is called Shepherd. Um, I do the laundry, my spouse does the dishes. It's worked out really well for us. We've been married for 30 years. So I, I highly advise splitting up some of the worst chores. Shepherd, given over to love, he scrapes the plates. Let's fall debris of meals, crumb shatter, rack of grains, slag of some greasy sustenance. Picks it all for the sake of the stainless tall tub of the gleaming new dishwasher. Given over to love long ago when his exasperated oath bounced off the quaint speckled enamel of the old double sink. The gate to his herder's instinct, so keen on constant strays, on lookout for the lost use of cups, the lambs of ramekins, the damn ram of frying pan. He swore, his vow, do this always and well. He fell in love then, he held the line against a wash of millions. He'd do them day by day, he would husband the flock. So there's some love poems. Um, my beloved downstairs, finishing up the, um, the, um, Chili rellenos we prepped with the hatch chilies that are in season right now. And I'm going to finish with just a, a short poem that you can see online if you want to hear the um, Ojibwe language more clearly. This is the short version. And it's one of the lexiconography poems where I'm looking at a dictionary and I get an idea for a poem. And in this one, um, I mentioned that, um, I mentioned, uh, the Nichols and Naya Home Dictionary and pages 158, 159, which were all the words for cloud and it filled up almost two pages of uh, words for cloud in Ojibwe. So with apologies to my teachers for my poor pronunciation. Cloud beings come laughing, comical. They come singing through the clouds, morning white clouds, Wabashkanaquad, a good color, Minwandamagud, Springtime is a comedy. Cloud beings come telling news. Clouds come as wind from a certain place. Undonimud. Cloud beings come to sit comfortable. in Minwebi. Cloud companion in summer. Wijiwagan. Red clouds come colored a certain way. Misquanaquad. Copper coins, hot coals, they come with a light. Fall dark clouds come into view. Zagonaquad, a ball headed club. They come in anger. War club, coals again, coffee. Winter comes, contests continually. Beboon, buckinage, apene. So thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. And remembering the night uh, at the Minnesota Book Awards that was so exciting and glamorous. Thanks. Thank you so much, Hyde. I love that. And I, we've been seeing so many clouds lately that I really, I love that you ended with that cloud poem. 
Um, that was fantastic. Our next author is Peter Guy, who also has a new novel that was just released in August. It is brilliant. I recommend that you all buy it and read it. Um, his most recent novel is Northernmost. So thank you for joining us, Peter. Oh, it's of course my pleasure, uh, Elaine. Thanks to you and everyone at the Friends, uh, Wendy, for helping uh, coordinate this whole uh, honky tonk tonight. Um, thanks to you too, Jody, at the library, manning the shop there. I'm so sad we're not up there on this beautiful early fall day uh, to, to be with the community there. Um, it would be lovely. And of course, uh, Karen and Hyde and Kalia, uh, I, I love, one of the reasons I love doing these so much, there are a couple of them. One is that we're often in parts of the state that we wouldn't otherwise or normally uh, necessarily visit. And it's so nice to get out and meet readers. The other reason is because we're always, uh, or I'm always paired, I should say, with such brilliant and terrific writers. And it's such a refreshing reminder of the state that we live in. Um, I'm just delighted to be a part of this community um, that seems to get bigger all the time, and I love that. And of course, to the participants, I trust that you're out there. Um, it's so weird not being able to see your faces in the audience, but I hope you're enjoying yourselves tonight. Um, yeah, as Elaine mentioned, I have a brand new book out. It's, uh, I guess, uh, two weeks old now. Uh, it's called Northernmost. Um, it's the third novel in a series of novels or companion novels about one family. Um, uh, it, it, and the cover seven generations and northernmost, which I'm so happy about this cover. I think it's just beautiful. Um, bookends those seven generations. So there's one storyline that takes place in 1897 and another, uh, storyline that takes place in 2017. And I'm going to read just a, a, a snippet from each, and there's not much to know because it happens right at the beginning of the, the story, but just uh, a little bit of context. The man that you'll be meeting first, his name is Odiner, and he has just returned from um, a harrowing uh, misadventure in the far Arctic, far northern Arctic, I should say. I heard the pastor before I saw him, his voice starting and stopping on the wind. Thou turnest man to destruction and sayest, return ye, children of men. Rainwater streamed down the cemetery path and I slipped on the rocks and muddied my hands and knees. I heard the horse neigh and stamp his hoof. Thou hast set our iniquities before thee, our secret sins in the light of thy countenance. For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our years as a tale that is told. What rot, I thought, my intestines twisting around the carrot I'd just eaten. I felt sickly, but also charged. We spend our lives in blind obedience. We pray for mercy and find only suffering. And if by reason of strength they be four score years, yet is their labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away but we fly home, and not by the grace of God, but by our wits and our own damn will. We are hungry, and you offer us nothing. We are cold, and you offer only wind and snow. We are lonesome, and you stow us in a ship's coal bunker. It was not the first time since I'd been lost that I became furious thinking of the dreck I'd heard in church all my life, but the pastor's psalm stoked my anger afresh, and I bumped into the horse's ass. Inger's shabby handbag set on the carriage's bench. The wind drew down. I patted the horse's withers, and he neighed and swung his muscled neck around to meet my eyes. His own went wide, and he snorted, and then I heard Inger's sweet voice as I looked up to see her, a freshly turned grave between us. My God, can that be you, she said. Inger? Did I say her name aloud? Did I say... Is that you? I noticed Bank and the pastor stepped back together as though startled. Inger's eyes widened as the horse's head, and she looked down at her Bible and closed it, and then looked at me from bottom to top. I took my hat from my head and held it before me as if I was some gentleman. I could see her trembling hands and heaving chest, and when stepping closer, her wet eyes now glaring at the gravestone at her feet, 
Inger, is that our daughter? Is that my Thea? She looked up and blinked the wetness away. Thea, she said and shook her head no. She said Thea again and finally came to me. She put a hand on my shoulder and then on my face and said, her fingers still holding my ratty beard, but you're dead, Odiner. Dead? That's what they said on Spitzberg and you and that man, Berger Mickelson, at Crossfjorden, killed by an ice bear. She kept her hand on my face as though she could not otherwise believe I was there. Berger died on the cross, Jordan, but I didn't. I'm home, Inger. When she dropped her hand, I could see the softness of the inside of her wrist and the pink of her cold flesh. What trailed her hand was a hand was a friend was a fresh was a fresh scent smelled before. Then coughed, and Inger looked over her shoulder, stuffed her hand into her pocket, and in the same motion stepped back beside the gravestone. The pastor came forward. And now he rested his hand on my shoulder and raised his gaze to the still shrouded skies. The waters saw thee, O oh God, the waters saw thee. They were afraid. The depths were also troubled. At this, he looked at me. I was but a man, he said softly before walking over to the carriage and climbing onto the seat. Now I looked at Bank, his thumbs hooked in his frock coat as he looked down his veiny nose, the grin of a fat of man spread across his face. He stepped to the gravestone and took Inger by the elbow, kicking at the ground with his leather boot. Don't carve in stone what could be branded on birch board. I guess that's the moral of this story. He bent his thick neck and whispered something in my wife's ear before turning back to me. But don't you worry, Odiner. I'll add the cost of this stone to what's already owed. Then he, too, walked to the carriage where he handed Inger her purse and took his seat next to the pastor. The horse nickered and turned down the cemetery path. Inger watched them go, the fog going with them, and I looked down at the gravestone. Ode Einar Eid, it read, born 1854, kapt by Isini Herrenzar, 1897. She turned to me, my wife did, and the look on her face left me to wish I had been lost on the ice in this treacherous year of life. The next chapter begins in 2017. She might have been watching herself asleep at home, the soft rise and fall of her belly and the arch of her hip under the gray duvet made violet by winter's darkness. But she wasn't watching herself, and she certainly wasn't sleeping. She hadn't slept properly since she couldn't remember when. And so she wasn't dreaming herself into a hummock of snow. She knew the mounds and curves were buried gravestones, taking light from the quivering aurora. She followed the light skyward up above the hillside as it melded into the blues and greens, and then an almost glaring orange, the color of a Lake Superior sunrise. She could as easily have been standing back on the shoreline in Gumflint now, her evening behind her. But in fact, she'd never been so far from home. And all that stood behind her was the dark church and beyond that sorrow sound in the islands distant across the water. She resisted an inclination to turn, to turn around and stare seaward, moving instead to another grave marker and brushing off the snow. She'd arrived here in the graveyard with as little forethought as she'd used in flying north altogether. Upon landing in Hammerfest, she checked into a hotel and tried to sleep and then tried to eat. Failing at the last two tasks, she'd put her boots back on and stepped again into the darkness. On the Strandgata, she looked left and right and saw in the latter snowy distance the church steeple. It seemed as fine a destination as any, and two blocks later she crossed into the cemetery with her mind suddenly on her ancestors who might be buried here. She cleared the first few markers of snow and played her iPhone's flashlight over the ground. She did this half a dozen times and then looked down the line of graves before scanning the graveyard altogether. Hundreds of stones were mounted under the snow. So instead of harvesting ghosts, she bunched her coat collar and gazed upward and studied the sky for what seemed a long time. If she missed her husband Franz or the kids, she didn't feel it. 
even as she conjured them sitting around the fire ring outside her father's fish house on a night such as this the sky over minnesota lit with its own phosphorescence she felt only her heart beating in time with the falling light of the polar sky above was it really only a month ago they last gathered around that campfire the kids roasted marshmallows franz had graham crackers and candy bars ready for s'mores because he was always vying for their attention, he moved opposite the kids and arranged his face so it was lit by the Halloween blaze. You guys might not believe this, he said slowly, the last faint trace of his accent still on his voice some 20 years after she heard it for the first time. But those auroras are not a natural phenomenon at all. No, sir. They're the wailing souls of all the dead women who never married. He looked at Liv, their daughter, the only one young enough or smitten enough to be enchanted by this old saw, and added, it might seem a wondrous thing, Liv, my love, to live among the stars, but think of all that time and never touching the earth again. Thank you. Thank you very Thank you very much. All right, so now to close out the portion of our readings, we have Cal Kalia Yang, and she has not one but two books coming out uh, this fall. So Somewhere in the Unknown World is a collective refugee memoir, and her third children's book, The Most Beautiful Thing, and they are due, I think, in in October. So we'll put a link there. You can pre-order both of those at uh, calkaliayang.com. And thank you so much for joining us here and welcome Kalia. Thank you for having me, Elaine, and thank you for that beautiful introduction. Thank you, Peter, for a beautiful reading. Hi, your poetry transports. And Karen, I miss you, so it was good to see you. Um, all of you, uh, thank you for joining us this evening. I'm going to close off the night by doing a reading from a children's book. I think it works well. Um, from a map into the world. The 2020 Minnesota Book Award winner for children's literature. At the beginning of this pandemic, Bob, who this book is dedicated to, who inspired in many ways this work, passed away. And although he was just across the street, I could not visit my good friend. Um, so this is for Bob. The book for Bob, who loved, for Bob Who Loved Ruth, a map into the world with illustrations by Seal Kim. I'll hold the book up occasionally, but not with every spread. The first time we saw the swing and the slide in the garden of the greenhouse with the big windows, my mother sat down in a chair in the backyard and said she did not want to get up. Tatai and I looked at the garden and she pointed out tomatoes, green beans, and a watermelon round as my mother's belly. The thigh knelt down to touch the dirt. I asked my mother if I could try the swing, and she said, yes, Bandao. The greenhouse became our house. I hope that thai hang the special story cloth about how the Hmong got to America on the empty wall by the big window of the living room. We saw an old man and woman through the window. They waved, we waved back. Later, my mother and father brought me across the street the old man's name was Bob, and the old woman's name was Ruth. Up close, I could see that they were even older than Thai Thai. Thai Thai and I were in the garden picking tomatoes and beans and checking on the watermelon when my parents brought my baby brothers home from the hospital. I ran to the gate. The boys were smaller than my baby dolls, but cuter than any doll with their fuzzy heads and red lips and round brown eyes. Some days the babies cried very loud. I covered my ears with my hands and asked my father to take me outside. Bob and Ruth sat on their special bench. We waved back and forth. The leaves of the two ginkgo trees by Bob and Ruth's house turned yellow like apricots. One day, a brisk wind blew and the fan-shaped leaves came flying down. They covered the grass and the street and the dark mouth of the train. Bob raked while Ruth sat and watched. I brought in a leaf for the babies to touch, but my mother said, they're still too little, Bandao. The 
The snow made the world quiet around us. We stopped seeing Bob and Ruth outside. The snowflakes fell on their driveway and glittered in the gray light. I made a ball of snow for my brothers, but it melted before they woke up from their nap. At night, I looked out our big window at Bob and Ruth's house to see their lights shining across the dark street. Sometimes I saw a shape of a person looking back at me. I waved, but the shadow person never waved back. On a cold morning, cars came to our block, filling the street. Car doors slammed as men and women in thick jackets walked quickly to Bob and Ruth's house. My father said, Ruth has died. Her family is coming to say goodbye. I felt sad for Ruth. My brothers, they just played with the toys above them. The cars kept coming and going the next day and the next. I swayed back and forth on my toes by the big window. I tried to lift one of my brothers so the people could see how cute he was, but he cried and my mother said, you're still too little to carry him, Fandao. After the Hmong New Year, my baby brothers learned how to sit on their own and we all sat looking out the window together. I clapped for them when a plane flew across the high skies. They laughed every time. The house across the street looked empty. The ginkgo trees reached for the sky with their thin fingers. When the snow started melting, I could not wait to return to the swing and the slide in the garden. My baby brothers crawled all over the floor, underneath the table and the chairs. They were like puppies, their tongues licking everything. I found the first warm of spring on the sidewalk and named her Annette. I wanted to bring her inside so my brothers could watch her wiggle, but my mother said, I don't think so, Bandal. The world became green again, and finally we all went outside. If I planted green onions, I picked flowers from the lilac bushes for my brothers to smell. They opened their mouths and they tried to eat them. My mother said, don't let them eat the flowers, Bandal. We took the babies outside again the next day after lunch. Bob's garage door opened, and we all watched as he pushed out his special bench. He sat down alone. I pulled my mother's sleeve until she looked at me. I whispered an idea in her ear. My mother and I crossed the street and walked over to Bob. I let the sidewalk chalk bucket swing in my hands. I asked my mother to ask Bob if I could draw on his driveway. I said, if he doesn't like it, the rain will come and wash it away. Bob nodded and said, go ahead. My mother and Bob talked in low voices. I could hear Bob say, Ruth, she was with me for 60 years. I started my picture with a teardrop. And then I made it splatter like sunshine. I drew lines leading away from the splattered sun in many directions. I drew a line that led to the garden. There I put a yellow ginkgo leaf. I drew a line that led to the grass. There I made the sparkling snow. I drew a line to the sidewalk. There I put a smiling worm named Annette. I drew an arrow to our house. There I added lilac flowers. And then I drew a line, the biggest line of all, toward the street. And there I drew the whole world. When I was done, I walked quietly to my mother and to Bob. They stopped talking and Bob shook my hand. What did you draw for me, he asked. I said in a whisper, a map into the world, just in case you need it. Bob said, I think I might. And that is from A Map Into the World a book about how we store the beautiful things that we carry and that we see in the world in our hearts 
and how in the moments when we need it most, we sometimes take it out for others. Um, we didn't get to say goodbye to Bob when he passed away, uh, but every, every time there was a pair of birds, my kids would say, maybe that's Bob and Ruth, and maybe they're coming to say goodbye. About a month ago, his children came to me and they said that they wanted me to have the special bench. Because as I said at the beginning, the story is very much inspired by true events. But I felt selfish keeping the special bench to myself. And so I found a home for it. It's gonna be at the Eastside Freedom Library, which used to be the Arlington Hills Public Library, which was my childhood library, my neighborhood library, and Bob's as well. And so once this pandemic is all over, I want to invite all of you to come to the Twin Cities and visit Bob's special bench at the Eastside Freedom Library. Again, I thank you for sharing your evening with us. Thank you so much, Kalia. That was that was just absolutely beautiful. Um, I I will for one, absolutely look forward to visiting the bench at the Eastside Freedom Library. I think that we've all been fortunate enough to have probably one of the most sensory experiences you can have on Zoom. There was so much atmosphere and feeling and I really felt like I could touch some of the things that you were all and feel the things that you were all um, speaking about and reading about. So thank you so, so much, Kalia, Peter, Hyde, and Karen. And now we'd like to open it up to some questions. So you can please, um, all of you who are out there, please feel free to start putting questions in the chat. And um, while you are doing that, I've got one to start off with. Um, just a little bit of a light topic. Um, I think there are so many questions that are raised right now in, in our current world and everything that's happening. And I heard a bit of an interview and it really struck a chord with me. And someone said that the theater, um, just as an art form, has a responsibility to reflect the current world back to its audiences. And I agreed with that. And as I was listening to it, I thought, well, I think writers do that just as much. And I'm really curious if the four of you want to reflect a little bit on, on whether you feel that kind of responsibility to reflect this world or maybe not reflect it, but speak to it in a certain way and whether everything that is going on right now with our pandemic and, and our struggles with systemic racism and everything that feels like it's kind of coming to a head in 2020, has this changed the way you approach or think about your own work as writers? So like I said, just, just um, a small question to start. <laughs> um, and so I don't know if, um, if anyone feels like they wanna jump in with that or if I uh, need to call on anyone, but I'll, I'll leave that up to you for a moment. Peter, I was gonna let you go first because your screen came on first. Oh, okay. Um, it's a terrific question, Elaine. And I think that for myself, one of the things that's become more true than ever, and this is something certainly that I've sort of um, intuited about my life or, or known somewhere subconsciously about my life for a long time, for, for, like for 30 years or more, is how important the act of reading is to, to me not only is something to help pass the time and something to be entertained by, but also to sustain me and nourish me in a way that nothing else can do. I imagine, though I'm, I'm, I'm not a, a religious person, I imagine that for, for many religious people, that is what their faith is about. Uh, and I go to stories for that same kind of nourishment and that same kind of um, sustenance, I guess. And what has become clearer to me over the last six months or, or, or eight months or however long this has been um, at the forefront of all of our minds right now, and I'm, I'm speaking now as a reader more than as a writer, but what has become clearer to me is how those stories um, are not only a source, though, and by those stories, I mean the stories that I read, the, the, the books that I read and, and, and the conversations, I guess, that I have about 
um, books and stories and how it intersects with the world that we're living in, especially with the systemic racism part of that question. Um, the, the, they, they ought to do more than that. They ought to be more than that sustenance that I talked about. They ought to be um, educational. They ought to inform me of things that I didn't know. They ought to uh, inspire me to open my mind in ways that I haven't always been comfortable opening my mind and, and frankly, opening my heart in ways that I haven't always opened my heart. And I've been thinking about that so much uh, over the over the over the last over this summer and the way that that has affected my work uh which i've been very busy with because that's also been a, something like a salve this this summer um is that i'm i'm asking of it to do things that i haven't necessarily asked it to do in the past which is be a, a vehicle or a, or a vessel for that kind of open heartedness. Um, and, and I don't know how to describe what that looks like exactly in the work, but there's just no question that I think as, as artists and as writers, we have a responsibility to, to, to help make sense of a world that doesn't always make sense of and to help. And this is a word that's been bandied about so much this year, but I think that it is, in my own estimation anyway, it's one of the most important words, ought to help us empathize with people uh, in the world that, in ways that we might not otherwise be able to. And so I'm aspiring to that. Thank you, Peter, for that. So I'm a refugee child. For much of my life in America, I came when I was six years old. I thought we came with very little because we didn't have very much in terms of things. It wasn't until actually about three years ago that I was in a conversation with a historian who was explaining to me why they didn't have anything Hmong in their, in their archives. It's because we didn't have things. And so I came and I talked to my, my uncle, who I think is very wise, and I said, this is what the historian said, that we don't have any artifacts, no evidence or documentation of the things that have happened to us. And my uncle looked at me and he said, hold up his like pants and he says, look at this scar, feel it. And I felt the scar all of my life, this rise of bone underneath flesh, flesh without hair because it's been so traumatized. And he says, look at what I've carried from that war. Look at what all of us have carried from, the, from, from that war. Look at what your mother carries from the refugee camps. My mother carried seven miscarriages, two little girls, but seven miscarriages from Babinai refugee camp. And I started thinking about how not just the work we do, but our very bodies are reflections of the worlds that we live in. You know, I'm a child of the east side of St. Paul. I'm 39. You know, I, I carried a dead baby inside of me at 19 weeks. I carried twins and a living one, and it all shows right here. I think every time I write, I look to reflect not only the physical part of me, but the internal landscape that I dwell on to a bigger world. I want to make the world a more beautiful place of my art, a more hopeful place. And I think I do that by reaching to the truth of experiences that I know and feel keenly. I'm dabbling in fiction. You know, I've entered into children's literature fully, as well as, you know, um, writing more in nonfiction, because I think these are all elements of my heart. These are all elements of my being. These are the elements of the world that we live in. There is, there's a truth there that anchors me. And I think that truth is the reason why I get up in the mornings and why I go to bed so late at night. It is, it is my call to go to the page and my call to open my mouth. And so, yeah, our bodies, our lives are reflections of the world around us. And at its very best, so is our art. And these are the documents of our times for so many of us whose bodies will one day shrivel, for all of us who will one day die. I've been thinking a lot about distance lately, um, mostly because I am uh, so far away from my family. Uh, and yesterday I got to talk to my four-year-old nephew who's like, I wish you could come live in our house. And I was like, it's very full at your house, but I <laughs> wish I could too. Um, but I, I keep thinking about how much of our lives in the last six months has been conducted online 
and you know my my teaching is online my uh you know hanging out with my friends is online um but i was thinking today just how much when i hang up from those those video calls um it's almost immediate the the distance is back uh, and so the energy exchange between people that I care about deeply, my, my family, my friends, my students, um, it doesn't last. Uh, and so I'm, I was thinking today about um, communication versus connections. And um, the, the work of the page and the work that I do in nonfiction, the work that I read um, is to connect with with other places and other people and other times. And it's, it's those pages that linger um, in a way that, you know, we, we try to keep in touch with, with people, um, but it's fleeting. Uh, and so I keep going back to a page to record, what is it that I feel today? What am I thinking today? And nothing might come of it, um, but I might not know that for five or 10 years. Um, but to know the thing is important in the moment is, is part of the joy of being a writer is that, you know, it's important. You don't know what you're going to do with it, you know, as an artist until the moment is right. Um, but I keep going back to the ways that the page, uh, creates connection between us and how that's important, especially now. I don't, I don't know what to say to that. I'm so in the moment and every moment seems incredibly long right now. I'm, it's, I think I'm in one of the oddest places I've ever been and I don't have all the things I thought I was going to be doing last year are, are not there. And my lifetime experience of writing into the world and about the larger world is just narrowed into some really um, intimate place where I'm more likely to write to myself than to anyone else. So, I mean, I feel like I've had some big changes, but I've also been editing a book that was only five months old when it got accepted for publication and I had less than a year to, to finish it. So um, yeah, so that, took up a lot of my space until uh, until June. And then after that, it was just our, you know, one thing after another. I, I'm not, I, some days I don't even know if I write anymore because um, it just feels like a different act. And if it weren't for the fact that I have this green mug that my husband gives me on writing days, I would forget. I'd be like, oh, I'm a writer. <laughs> Because there's just so many other things happening. It's just wild. Oh, wow. I, I like that as a kind of a, a talisman, uh, you know, that kind of, you know, the mug. I thank you all so much for sharing those thoughts. I really, I love, though, that that, that runs the gamut from really this, this huge, wide world of, of hope and change down to the, to the, the minusculous bits of ourselves that we're we're wrestling with right now it does it does feel i know i mean at least for me personally it does it swings this this, this kind of amazing pendulum that is going from the the vast big picture to the tiny minutia and it it's happening a million times a day um and our, our audience is a little bit reticent with questions. So i'm i'm going to flip on that pendulum i'm going to go to the other side and what's been a good escape for you, whether it's reading something or watching or, or, or looking at the birds in the windows or, or what is it? Do you have anything that you've um, found to be a really good escape for you over the last couple of months? I'll start with a quick answer. Um, I have been really fascinating with stuff about World War II Nazis and that the kind of escapes I take are diving right into the worst of it. So. Yeah, that's where I am. And it, it does actually. And also mudlarking the Thames. I watch videos on YouTube of what people find along the Thames in the mud. Very soothing. Those are the best Twitter accounts to follow. Um, uh, yeah. 
Uh, unfortunately, my escape is not cooking. Um, I have found it uh, because I can't bring baked goods to the office and uh, I don't have anybody to cook for. I can't have people over. Um, cooking has become not something I want to do. Uh, and so I have not done a sourdough starter. I have not, I also have commitment issues, I think. And so sourdough starters are nothing that I've ever been able to do. Um, they last two days and that's, but, um, I, I will say that the only culinary thing that I have really gotten into in the last six months is um, I have, because I've been here all summer, um, I got to have an herb garden for the first time in a really long time. And so um, it's been really fun to um, cook with, with things that I am not used to cooking with. Um, and especially getting used to uh, southern foods and, and ingredients that I am not used to. Um, that's, I mean, when I am cooking, that's actually been really fun. For me, well, well a couple of things. Um, we moved in, um, gosh, when was it? In the, in the, right at the beginning of May into a house that we had only seen and before we moved as being buried under snow. Um, and it has this really nice, lovely yard. It's a quite big yard. We had no idea though that it was uh, this like sort of castle-like grounds garden all over the place. Just more flowers and, um, and cherry trees and raspberry bushes and thimbleberry bushes all over the place. We had no idea any of that was there. So we spent a good part of this summer just being out among the, the flowers and, and picking weeds and mowing the lawn and sitting on the patio and resting our minds from the, from the world. Um, and the other thing I've been doing to, to take it easy, and Elaine, you know this because you've, you've seen me, is taking our sweet dog out for a walk. Um, it's it's true. Everyone, well, not everyone, but I often hear people talking about how good the pandemic is for for dog uh, for dogs and pets. And certainly, uh, my dog, who we've had for just a year, um, and and obviously had a really hard life before she got to us. She was a rescue dog, but is now like the happiest, sappiest dog on the planet. And if she were the reason she's not in my office right now is because she'd be sitting, her face would be right here. She's a 60 pound lap dog. So taking a lot of walks with her. I don't, I don't generally like to escape. So I throw myself into the void more often than I should, which means it's a lot of doom scrolling. It's a lot of reading the news. Um, but I offset that by taking deep breaths of my children's hair. I know that this, these are the last two years or that will be a very pleasurable experience. Uh, my boys are five and my, my little girl is seven. And so I take deep long breaths of their hair. And my husband, who's a very kind hearted guy, but not very romantic. I'm not romantic either. So it's not a problem for us. But uh, this, at the beginning of this pandemic, he planted a rose garden. Uh, eight different rose bushes, climbing roses, and they're all growing. And every time I enter that space, I feel my heart um, slowing down and my breaths growing deeper and longer. And so that's been a gift. That's wonderful. Thank you. Now I have, I, I really will have to check out the mudlarking and uh, many other things here. Thank you. We've um, started to get some questions in, and there are a few about process. And there was one that, that really resonated here when you're writing, how do you decide what you will share with the world and what is for you? You were referencing that a little or speaking to that a little bit, Karen, about the things you know, that might just be or hide. Also, you may be writing more to yourself, but is it obvious to you when something is, is ready to be out in the world or how do you see that, that line? I tend to not write about things that hurt. Um because I don't like to be that vulnerable on the page. And so All the Wild Hungers is way out of my comfort zone on a lot of levels. Um, but when I wrote it, my mom was going to be fine. Uh, she was technically cancer free. Um, and, and the cancer didn't come back until like six months after like the, the chronicle, chronological end of the book. Um, and so, you know, it was, it's a pretty joyful book because she was going to be fine. Um, 
but I, I don't find myself as a subject to be that interesting. I am more interested in the mudlarking um, and, and the things that are just weird about the world. Um, and there's, there's so much to write about and there's so much to think about and there's, there's never an end of, of noticing and um, connections to be made between one thought and the next. And, um, and so, you know, I, the, the personal things um, are generally in service of something else. And so, um, you know, when, when something's ready to, to send off, um, sometimes I send off things way too early. Um, and it's very clear uh, in that process. That was not a thing I should have done. Um, but that's what rejections are for. <laughs> um, but yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm working on something right now that's a little closer to um, vulnerability than I am currently comfortable with. Uh, I am writing about uh, some things that uh, happened in my dad's his my dad's family's history. Uh, there's some there's some things that happened to his his ancestors, um, and I need to edit out a lot of that. Uh, and so my my goal is never to even inadvertently hurt anybody, uh, especially people that I care about. And so I need to figure out a way to craft that uh, in a way that the the story itself is still there um but it it doesn't i mean all of its rough edges are are sanded to a point where the story is what matters not the hurt for myself i think that um i i i guess i always begin or continue with the intention that whatever i'm writing that day is going to be something good enough to to, to make the cut. Of course, it doesn't always happen that way. Um, and so then to the question of how do you decide what to leave in and what to leave out, to, to describe that process for me would be almost impossible because uh, first of all, it's so hard to think back and to uh, imagine the things that you wrote that didn't make the cut or the things that you left in that shouldn't have made the cut and questions like that. Um, and, and the the sort of what is it like the aftermath of, is maybe a good word of writing a novel is um, it's something that I try as quickly as possible to forget and move on with 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 something new. Um, so I don't know I don't know how to answer the question about what how to decide what what gets left in. I it's always my ambition that everything is is good enough to be a part of it. I think I write from a very a very different space space from Karen. I know that the work that I'm writing is brave and I feel incredibly vulnerable. So so that's how I read my own work. Um, I I I my first drafts are never pretty and I always submit my first drafts people. That that's the thing about me because the parameters of my life don't allow me to do anything else. You know, I submit something that has the power and the ability to move me. If I'm moved by something, if I believe there is something very real there, then I send it out. And I rely on a team of agents and editors to help respond and give me another chance to go at it, another chance to do a better job. So yeah, if it's moving for me and it teaches me new things that I don't yet know about myself or the world, then I think it's worth sharing with another. Um, I. I think you cannot fake an authentic voice on the page and authenticity is something that's really important to me. And so I send these first drafts into the world and then they come back and if I have a go at it, I make it better than it was. And it's that transformation where the elements of craft come in and where I become a little bit maybe braver and more creative and more imaginative than I normally am. We've got some more questions that are um, sort of along those ideas of inspiration, which you've all touched on a, a bit, but inspiration in the pandemic and, and this, you know, this idea that we all, for the most part, used to be able to go out and, and see more of the world or even, you know, like our small worlds or the larger world. But when you are mostly 
you know, bounded by your yard and, and your walls. Um, where are you finding inspiration right now? That's a hard one um, because it's so, for me, it's so difficult to sort of separate um, what, what seems important to think about and what's important in, 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 this, in the novel that I'm working on. Like these, the, the, the feeling, um, my, my mind is already muddled and I'm only on the first step of trying to describe this. The feeling that I want my book to convey the subject doesn't allow for it necessarily to directly um, uh, have a kinship with the the with what's happening in the world right now, which what, what, with what seems so important in the world right now. And again, I mean the 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 coronavirus, and I mean um, the other social justice issues that are at the forefront of everyone's mind, or, or at the forefront of so many people's minds. Um, so, so it's it's not easy to say. Oh, I can just address this in this way, or I can just talk about it in this way. And so, what what I've um, what I've been thinking about, and what I've been trying to um, translate through this story of mine, is the way that we reflect on our lives, the way that we empathize and sympathize with the people we've hurt and the people who have hurt us, and the way that family, um, especially the nuclear family, um, plays such an enormous role, even, even if that nuclear family is somewhat estranged or, or has been difficult to live with, um, not that mine has, but in this story, the, the characters has been, um, how, how that reverberates over the course of time. And hopefully the effect of that is that um, the things that are important for me to think about in the world right now that, again, don't have much directly to do with the story that I'm working on, I'm still trying to take the influence of that and, and, and realize the importance of that. And in this indirect and hopefully artful and subtle way, make those connections. Again, using empathy and, and, and sympathy as the, as the big guiding lights in that. I tend not to believe too much in inspiration. Um, I remember when I was in college, um, we did a, a one of our projects um, was to to interview writers, and uh, my partner and I uh, were given Will Weaver to interview, and he was teaching at Bemidji State at the time. We sent him an email, asked him all these questions, and one of them was, "Do you have a writing schedule? Like, what what's your process?" Uh, and his answer, I have never forgotten this, was that he wrote every day because it would be a shame if the angel of fiction showed up and he wasn't there. <laughs> Which, I mean, I, I love it because it's, it's a reminder that writing is work. It's not magic. And so um, it's, it takes the same sort of, of effort uh, as anything else that is worth doing well. So... Um, I didn't do this at the beginning. Um, when I, when I started off, I believed deeply in inspiration. Um, and then, you know, life changed. Uh, and so now I do, uh, three pages of long handwriting every day before I do anything else. Um, some days it's easy. Some days it's hard. Some days I skip it. Um, but it's the work of putting words to a page. And so no matter what else I do in the day, I have done the thing that means the most to me um, already. And I don't have to worry about fitting it in somewhere around other things. I don't have to get to, you know, sunset and like, oh, shoot, I haven't written today. I don't feel like doing it because I've already done it. Uh, and so sometimes it leads to something. Um, Actually, All the Wild Hungers was written on morning pages um, because I was processing what I had cooked the day before. It is less successful now when I'm not actually doing anything um, because I don't leave my house, really. Um, and, you know, I'm not doing the things that um, would lead to, act, you know, making morning pages easy. Um, 
but they're still processing things and and that's important um because you know we go through a lot of words that we will eventually cut and that don't work and i'm writing a lot of those right now so hopefully when when things slow down or you know get sort of back to normal the good words will come back um but in the meantime it still feels like i am a writer because writers write and um as long as i can put some words to a page inspiration might come it might not but i'm still feeling like i'm doing the work and i put in the um comments i i envy people with a good solid practice you know um i put in the comments that i was lucky enough to have grace paley as a mentor and grace what would say do you write anything new and i would say no sometimes and she'd say ah go live your life <laughs> and it just meant a lot to me like sometimes you just have to meet life and that's where i find what i'm going to write about so i feel like it's always work i feel holistic about it um also i had you know a lot of my work comes from dreaming so I throw the words in the head and the ones that stick after a dream are the ones that I'm, I'm going to keep working on. And oftentimes I memorize a poem sort of in my head before I put it on the page and I, I, you know, I make it an object and that's really important to me. Essays are a whole nother thing. You just got to, you know, button chair and march through it. And that's one of the things that I find really difficult when I'm working on prose. Um, I feel like I really do have to have a, a different sort of schedule and a different sort of process. Inspiration isn't a problem for me, but sleep is. <laughs> so I find more often than not that when I'm at my desk and I actually have time, I'm just fighting sleep. You know, I have, my kids are all sleep fighters. Um, even in the middle of the night when one of them, two of them, three of them crawl into bed with me, there is in that warm inspiration to be found. I'm inspired by lots of things every single day, but my enemy is actually rest, is actually sleep. And so um, when I'm writing, I feel like I'm not breathing, if that makes sense. When I'm really writing, I forget to breathe and I'm holding my breath the whole time. And the whole experience is just, um, I'm, I'm waiting for the moment when I can breathe again. But I don't, I don't have control over that. And so in that way, it is, it is a little bit magical for me. Um, editing isn't. Proofreading isn't magical. These are things that have to be done, that have to be done on deadline. But the actual act of writing remains a very magical thing for me when I have enough sleep that I can stay awake and hold my breath and know that I won't die in the process. And even if I do, it would be a good death. Thank you all. I, I have to say that that coming to um, my own work and to events like these, I am I am firmly on the side of the, not the side, but as a reader, I approach um, all of this. And I find a tremendous amount of inspiration from all of you and and what you have been sharing with us, both your written work and and your thoughts today. I'm I'm so grateful uh, for those perspectives and ideas and your stories. And I'm grateful to our audience, which we know is out there. So thank you all very much for sharing the evening with us. Um, to continue the thank yous, Jody, thank you so much to you and to the whole Park Rapids Area Library, the Kichigami Regional Library System for their partnership on this event. And um, and all of you out there, we are hosting more Moving Words Writers Across Minnesota events. We have two next week. Um, again, these will be recorded, so if you aren't able to catch them on the night of, you can revisit them later. But next Tuesday, in partnership with the Montgomery Public Library, we have a very strong on Minnesota history event with Jack L. High, William D. Green, Sheila O'Connor, and Gwen Westerman. So it promises to be a really fantastic conversation. Um, Again, um, want to say please check out beagleandwolf.com. Uh, please visit the writer's website, see what else they have, um, and, and buy books and read. And 
also will be sending everyone who registered for tonight um, a brief survey and that'll come to you on Monday likely. Please do take a moment and fill that out. We really appreciate your feedback and so do our grant funders. So I'll just put that pitch in there right now. Um, thank you again so, so much, Karen, Peter, Hyde, Kalia. Um, I really, I, I'm, I'm so pleased to have been able to spend this time with you and I know that, that our listeners um, were as well. So thank you all very, very much.